Good morning, everyone. This is Natalie Gilly with the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Welcome to the Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about e-bikes, and I'll go ahead and share my screen here, and we welcome you all to the webinar. So our webinar today is on April 20th, 2022. Gas is in the past. Let's talk e-bikes. We'd like you all to introduce in the, in the chat box, please type your name and location so we can see where you're joining us today. And also a couple of questions if you'd like to answer them when you, when you type into the chat box. First of all, do you own an e-bike? And if you don't own an e-bike, are you planning to buy an e-bike this year? So we'd like to hear from you in the chat box about where you're at with e-bikes and, and if you're already uh, rolling. So we welcome folks today from Thief River Falls, Olmsted County, Duluth, Rochester, and we have uh, a bunch of no's, but uh, one from Duluth here e-biked last Saturday, bought one last year, loved it, and uh, a number of other folks here. Lots of folks interested in e-bikes today, it looks like, um, from what I can tell here in the answers in the chat box. So thanks and welcome to the webinar. The purpose of the Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network is to connect local bike walk leaders to share stories and ideas about how they're lifting up the walking and biking culture in their communities. We have a land acknowledgement statement. We want to acknowledge that we occupy the ancestral land of the several indigenous groups, including the Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Cheyenne, Oto, Iowa, and Meskwaki people. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We affirm the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities. Despite centuries of colonial violence, this is still and always will be indigenous land. Indigenous peoples are still here demonstrating innumerable talents and gifts in the midst of continued oppression. They must be celebrated and uplifted. You'll see at the bottom of the slide here, there is a link if you'd like to find out what indigenous land you are currently located on. We meet for the Minnesota Bike Walk Leadership Network on the third Wednesday of the month here on Zoom at 1130. And here are a couple of the webinars coming up in May. On the 18th, we'll be talking Open Street and we'll have a speaker from our streets on there. So if you'd like to join and hear a little bit more about open streets and learn how you might host one an event such as that in your community, join us on May 18th. And then we'll be continuing with topics about the bikeable community workshops, which many of you may be participating in this summer uh, with Tim Brackett, our Green Corps person. Uh, back to school information in the fall, and then try shots. So we'll get into some of this information later in the, in the season and uh, invite you to continue to join us here. You may also be part of the Safe Routes to School Network and the Safe Routes to School Network will be meeting. The next uh, webinar they'll be hosting is May 5th from 10 to 11. They will be talking about ship major updates bike to school day reports, active transportation planning, and a school siting review, as well as some walk bike fun updates. And then in June, they'll meet on the second. So if you'd like to join that network, if you're not already connected, feel free to reach out to Eric T at movemn.org. If you'd like to participate in a bike to school day, we invite you to do so. That will be held on May 4th and you can register your school, participate in the poster contest, share on social media, hashtag MN Bike Day, and definitely take pictures, take pictures and share the pictures. So uh, we invite you all to participate in that. Before we get into our featured speakers today, I'd like to welcome Jake Ruder from MnDOT to the call here. And he would like to talk a little bit about active transportation planning assistance solicitation. Welcome to the webinar, Jake. Thanks, Natalie. And this will be brief because I don't want to be in between you and what you all are, are here to hear about. Um, my name is Jake Ruder. I'm the active transportation coordinator at MnDOT and I'm here to share with you all a planning assistance solicitation opportunity that we have available. Um, we are currently accepting applications for communities to apply for technical assistance to do active transportation plans in their communities. Um, so these plans identify barriers, destinations, and solutions for both infrastructure and non-infrastructure needs. 
successful communities who apply will be paired with a consultant team to help do an active transportation plan. There's a bunch of different types that you can apply for, whether it's a corridor or a neighborhood plan or a full community plan. Um, we have a couple of informational webinars. So the first one has already passed, but there is one coming up on Monday at 1030. Um, the content of both of those webinars is the same. So missing the first one and coming to the second one is completely fine. We'll talk about how to apply, what the program looks to achieve, um, what you could expect if you are a successful applicant, um, and some tips for the application as well. We're accepting applications through June 10th. Um, so if you are looking to get a group together to apply for that, that's your target deadline date. Um, and we hope to start the planning process with selected communities uh, in September of 2022. Um, Luke is asking if the Regional Development Commission will be the consultant and the, I can answer that by saying no, but I can't tell you who the consultant is yet as we're still working through the contract process. Um, so happy to uh, take questions by email. Before I hop off the call, I'll leave my email in the chat um, so you can reach out if you have questions about the program. Thank you, Ted, for putting the link to the program in the chat box as well. Um, and I hope you all have a great webinar. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Jake. You answered all the questions I was thinking about asking you when you were done talking. So that's wonderful. So definitely reach out to Jake if you'd like to hear more about this. And I encourage you to take part in this uh, solicitation to help fund the projects you'd like to implement in your community. So today we're talking e-bikes. Gas is in the past. Let's talk e-bikes. And we have two speakers that are going to talk to you today about e-bikes. And the first is Dorian Greeley, our executive director here at the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. So I will hand it over to Dorian. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Natalie. Um, and that is a picture of my Yuba Boda Boda. Um, as you can see, it has a basket on the front two huge panniers on the back. Um, the basket on the front will hold our community supported agriculture half share box. Um, and the panniers on the back will each hold a 50 pound bag of dog food. Uh, so that's, you know, two or three bags of groceries each. Uh, so it is soon to become our second car. Uh, we haven't disposed of our second, our old car, but, uh, We'll be doing that soon, and that's a that's a major transformation for us. So, for those of you who are new and and uh, not close with the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, I thought I'd start with a little introduction to Bike MN. Um, and the most important thing to note is that we have a new strategic plan, and we slightly changed our vision and mission. Um, it's still about advocacy and education. Um, and it's still about everybody being able to easily and safely bike, walk and roll um, as part of their daily life. So really just kind of reworded um, uh, those statements as part of our strategic plan. And uh, it's, it's our, our plan is still to continue working with communities and businesses um and the legislature uh to make all this stuff happen and all of our wonderful partners our chapters uh uh the statewide health improvement partnership folks um and uh climate action people so and e-bikes has become increasingly uh part of climate strategies for a lot so uh next slide I always like to say that we are not anti-car. Um, we are simply, you know, pro-bike, pro-walk, pro-roll. And that allows us to maintain a really strong bipartisan relationship with the legislature. Uh, next, Natalie. If you look at the list of climate action plans that there's only 14, uh, most of them are in the metro area, but there's Duluth. Duluth and Rochester have climate action plans. There's lots of communities uh, all over the state that are doing, um, uh, you know, talking about climate strategies and whatever. But almost every one of those listed in the metro area 
has a climate action plan um, of, are, are among the 14 climate action plans in Minnesota. And I think it's really an interesting coincidence that, uh, or not an, <laughs> an obvious relationship between bike-friendly communities and communities that have climate action plans. So, uh, and, and needless to say, uh, the businesses listed on the bottom of that slide are very interested, not only in supporting the health and safety of their employees, but uh, uh, maintaining a green image. Um, and we're more than happy to help. So next slide. One of our one of our biggest ways, and I think most of you know this, is uh, uh, we help develop an elementary school safety curriculum called Walk Bike Fun, and have been in the business of implementing it for close to a decade now. This is an out of date slide. Um, we're approaching a thousand teachers, uh, and those teachers or educators are reaching an average of about a hundred kids each. So. Um, but we're not going to stop until we reach all the kids in Minnesota, and I don't think um, I don't think we're even past fifty percent yet with uh, with our network, our education network, uh, and safe walk bike fun network. Next slide. So, as you know, we're a very active organization, and use that base of support uh, that we've created through the bike friendly community, bike friendly business and our education work to have a strong grassroots advocacy base at the Capitol. Um, we sent out an action alert last Thursday. I'm sure many of you got it and many of you uh, responded um, to, that simply said, you know, tell your legislators that they need to pass a transportation bill that includes significant money for biking and walking. Um, the good news is uh, uh, there is significant money for biking and walking in both the Senate and the House bills. And, uh, and I think close to 400 messages got sent to legislators from our action alert. So I talked about this in a previous webinar, but I wanted to remind you that uh, MnDOT um, has quite a bit of money for safe routes to school. Uh, the active transportation money uh, uh, funded with five, you know, the five million for active transportation was what provided MnDOT the opportunity to do what Jake just talked about, contract with a, a, a consultant to work with communities all over the state. Uh, the RFP uh, said they need to do over 40 active transportation plans. So. Um, Again, th these are things that happened last year at the Capitol. Uh, the, the, the first two were bargains. You know, the, the House gave up something um, to the Senate to get the first two in there. But the Class 3 e-bike bill was bipartisan and passed unanimously in the Senate and the House uh, committees to be added to the omnibus transportation bill. So that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, an important thing to note is that the three class e-bike bill um, had very, very strong bipartisan support. Uh, we had uh, some business people, including Eric Saltvold of Eric's Bike Shop, testify to the committees, which I think really made a difference in that uh, bipartisan support. We're also working on an operation of uh, operation of a bicycle update uh, that we've been working on for five years uh, or more, um, and that did not pass. Uh, I think it actually has a better chance of passing this year. So, and that is simple things like changing as far to the right as practicable, that a bicyclist must ride as far to the right as practicable to as far to the right as is safe. Um, and allowing a bicyclist to ride through a right turn lane uh, without turning right. Uh, I know none of us are getting tickets for that, but if you get in a crash um, with somebody who's turning left and, and hits you when you're riding through a right turn lane, uh, their smart defense attorney 
uh, will quickly come to the conclusion that it was your fault as you were breaking the law by riding through a right turn lane. So anyway, little things like that. Um, next slide, Natalie. Uh, so that's, and I, I also did a, an update. Um, just be aware of all the things that are coming um, through the state of Minnesota from the federal government. 60% more for the federal transportation alternatives program, which would be more money for safe routes to school. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to partner with some of you at least to figure out uh, how to tap some of the federal safety money uh, for safe routes to school uh, and work with uh, DPS and MnDOT uh, to create a vulnerable user safety plan um, and, and how to figure out, uh, although the federal government did not pass a, a lot of money um, for climate, but how to figure out how to use some of that um, for bicycling and e-bikes. And the good news is, you know, it's pretty universal that um, when they're putting in charging stations for cars, um, that they will include a charging station for your e-bike. So you can just plug in your e-bike. St. Paul already has some, I think, in St. Paul in downtown that, um, and, and the Build Back Better law that passed did not, or did not pass, um, but it includes an e-bike tax credit and a bicycle commuter benefit. Um, so we need to keep lobbying um, for those things with our national partners to make sure they do. Uh, next one, Natalie. So just wanted to thank uh, Senator Dibble uh, and Representative Elkins for being our e-bike champions at the Capitol last year. Uh, they did a great job. And uh, uh, as I said before, passed both the House and Senate with uh, little discussion and unanimously with bipartisan support. That law went into effect August 1st, 2021. And Matt will be talking about the details. Um, but next slide. I just wanted to give you a little uh, history about the evolution of e-bike laws. Um, prior to 2012, an e-bike was not a bicycle. It was a moped. It had to be licensed and insured. And I believe you even had to wear a helmet. Um, but in 2012, um, we again partnered with bike industry uh, and made e-bikes uh, legal in Minnesota as bicycles meaning you could ride them on trails on anywhere that a bicycle um, and they're subject to the same laws. So if we are able to update the operation of bicycle statute, those will apply to e-bikes. So, but the major change was um, for the last several years, the bike shops have been selling three classes of e-bikes, um, meaning there was a gray area um, for class two and class three e-bikes, meaning that ones that uh, had a throttle uh, or had pedal assist and went more than 20 miles an hour um, were not necessarily legal in Minnesota. And uh, uh, I actually spoke with some uh, e-bike riders that were riding class two or class three e-bikes and were in crashes. And the police officers, again, uh, said, well, it's not the driver's fault, even though they pulled in front of you um, because you're riding an illegal bike. Um, so that was really, really frustrating. So um, I'll turn it over to Matt. Uh, this is now the law, the class three system is now the law in 36 states. So Matt, thanks for being with us. And Natalie, did you introduce Matt? I'll go ahead and do that now. Did you want to speak to this slide before we get to the next one, or is this a Matt? No, Matt slide? Matt's going to talk about that one. All right, Matt, I'll go ahead and introduce you a little bit so folks on the call, if they're new to you and new to uh, quality bicycle products, they can hear a little intro about where you come from. So uh, Matt currently serves as general counsel and risk manager at Quality Bicycle Products, where he has worked in several capacities since starting in the warehouse in 1996. He received his law degree with honors from Hamlin University in St. Paul. 
and also holds degrees in philosophy and history from St. Olaf College. Matt is on the board of People for Bikes, a national advocacy group, and co-chairs their safety and legislative committee, which addresses state and federal regula regulatory issues regarding bicycles and publishes the Bicycle Owner's Manual. Matt is a former board member of the League of American Bicyclists, Nice Ride Minnesota, the Minnesota Off-Road Cyclists, and serves as the legal committee serves on the legal committee of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Matt has lived with his family and his collections of bicycles and vintage Volvos in South Minneapolis for over 30 years. Welcome to the webinar, Matt. Oh, thank you, Natalie, and, and thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. Yes, I, I embarrassingly have, have four automobiles, which is now a lifetime supply, so um, maybe thinning the herd and, uh, you know, now that gas has passed. Um, and I, I actually am remiss, I should have a slide here for my, uh, my employer who, who makes my advocacy work possible, Quality Bicycle Products. Uh, if you do not know, we are the leading supplier for bicycle retailers in the United States. Um, virtually every bicycle shop uh, is uh, one of our valued customers. Uh, we started in 1981 in our owner's garage in Bloomington. And we're still headquartered there. And we now have facilities in Pennsylvania, Colorado, uh, and Nevada, and, and a total of 800 employees, which is a far cry from where we were when I started uh, in back in 96. Um, recently, last January, we converted into a B Corp, which is a public benefit corporation. Um, while of course our goal is still to make money like other businesses, we do have uh, incorporated into our uh, corporate mission, um, serving the community, which is, which is something we have really done since, since the company was founded. Um, we've always supported bike men and national ag advocacy organizations. Um, we have full, two full-time people now who just work on advocacy issues in, in addition to my volunteering work. Um, and we devote 6% of our after-tax profits um, into donating back to communities in hundreds of, of, uh, of different projects across the country. So um, really a fine place to work and I will say if if someone's looking for work or has a has a relative that's looking for work in Bloomington, we're hiring. You know, go to our website www.kbp.com. Um, so uh, one of the outcomes of people for bikes work in the e-bike space uh, was crafting a model law that created the three class system, and you can see they've th this was a multi year effort. Um, and I will say that I was not, I was not the leader for that. Um, People for Bike staff developed the law and worked to uh, to advocate for it in in many states. Um, and the current status is there are are 36 states that have adopted the same or very similar legislation. There are a few outliers, and I believe uh, all of those red and yellow states uh, are currently on the list to uh, introduce a bill uh, or have bills pending. I believe New York, which has been a, a kind of a holdout state um, with some a difficult uh, political process in New York uh, at many at all levels, uh, including New York, New York City. Um, I think we are making some progress and, and that state might be added to uh, the list this year. Um, but by and large, the goals here were to, to make the laws uniform. So there would be a kind of agreement among the states on what these, what these vehicles are and how, to, how they can be operated. Um, so that uh, you know, people, for example, traveling um, would not run into that problem of uh, having a bike that was perfectly fine in Minnesota, but was uh, considered an illegal vehicle in South Dakota. So next slide, please. So what is an e-bike? So all, uh, all legislation uh, really starts with a definition section. And, and that's really what we're, we're largely talking about today. So in Minnesota, it's Minnesota Statute 169.011, um, subdivision 27 uh, defines uh, what is an electric bicycle. Um, so if you follow along here, class one, 
is a bicycle equipped with an electric motor that provides assistance only when the rider is pedaling and it ceases to provide assistance when the bicycle reaches a speed of 20 miles per hour. This is an electric assist, very typical uh, approach to an electric bicycle. It's not on all the time. It doesn't do all the work for you. Uh, it just assists, provides additional power while you are pedaling. Class two uh, is a bicycle with an electric motor, again, capable of propelling the bicycle without the rider pedaling. Uh, but ceases to provide assistance when the bicycle reaches the speed of 20 miles per hour. This is a so-called throttle bike. You really, you go when you turn the throttle on the handlebar and uh, uh, it, it will provide a variable assist depending on, on uh, how much you activate the throttle. But it had, does have a maximum speed of 20 miles per hour. And the, the uh, last class, class three uh, is a bicycle that provides assistance. So it's, a, it's an assisting uh, of the rider while they're pedaling, but it has a top speed of up to 28 miles per hour. Uh, I used to have a top speed of 28 miles per hour um, with maybe with a tailwind, but <laughs> it's pretty hard. <laughs> so that's, that actually, uh, it, it, that top speed is, is uh, probably at near the limits of what a, a very fit cyclist would do uh, or and probably not sustained for a very long period of time. Um, and, and that can cause concern, uh, you know, actually with legislators when they see that 28 miles per hour, it seems really fast. Um, but people for bikes and, and others have done studies that show uh, while these bikes have that capability, the average speed of the, uh, the rider really isn't much more than, uh, than a typical cyclist, a human powered cyclist would achieve uh, uh, while they're using the bike. So. It is a capability limitation, um, not uh, a constant speed. Again, you have to pedal to, uh, to attain that speed. Um, next slide. E-bikes are, are very similar, or I will say many of the models on the market are, are really adapted from a standard bicycle. Um, with the addition of these three uh, components. The, there's a motor unit. Usually that can be at the, uh, the bottom bracket area of the bicycle. Commonly it's also in the uh, rear hub. Uh, there's a rear hub motor uh, on the bicycle instead of a mid drive. Uh, some uh, units have a, a front wheel drive, but um, those are less common. Uh, there will be a battery. Uh, Years ago, that would be a lead acid battery, heavy, similar to a car battery, but smaller. And now they are all really lithium ion based batteries. Uh, and then there's a computer uh, that regulates the speed, provides data for the rider. Uh, there might be a battery monitoring system that battery, battery maintenance system that also kind of controls the battery usage um, for the rider so they, uh, to maximize the battery life. Um, the maximum wattage under uh, Minnesota law and under uh, federal CPSC regulations for an e-bike is uh, 750 watts. Next slide, please. So uh, the model law uh, also requires that the manufacturer uh, fix a, a permanent label to the bicycle that specifies which which class it is, class one, two, or three. Um, that's for both for the benefit of the consumer um, and to al allow authorities you know, to determine what is this machine um, that I've encountered in my regulatory uh, enforcement activities. Um, as I said, e-bikes are regulated by the CPSC as a consumer product, just like bicycles. Uh, and in fact, the same regulation uh, that applies to bicycles as far as safety equipment and testing applies to e-bikes. They really just added e-bikes in into their definitional section uh, a few years back so that they would also be covered. They're limited to 750 watts and a 20 mile per hour maximum speed with motor power only. Um, and this was a source of confusion, um, but the CPSC has um, determined that a class two bike with a 20 mile per hour maximum speed meets this requirement and that a class three bike will meet this requirement even though it can go 
uh, 28 miles per hour with motor still working um, because of this language of with motor only. So all three classes are lawful under CPSC regulations, however, they do apply to them. Um, recently, um, Underwriters Laboratory um, with the uh, involvement of the CPSC and many major uh, e-bike manufacturers and drive system manufacturers created uh, a voluntary standard for both batteries and drive systems to cover the uh, design and uh, I would say durability of the drive systems, the wiring, protection from electrical hazards, shock hazards, et cetera. And uh, those are, while they are voluntary, um, uh, most manufacturers are, major manufacturers are complying with those uh, as that would be what the CPSC would look to if there was some sort of issue with a particular model. Next slide, please. All right. One of the problems um, in the marketplace, um, I will say is that not all uh, vehicles being advertised and sold as e-bikes actually meet the definition of the model law or um, CPSC requirements. So all major manufacturers, and these include Shimano, Bosch, the large, you know, odd German, international, I would say, um, motor vehicle component supplier, um, companies like Yamaha, all of your major bike brands that sell e-bikes, they have, uh, of course have <laughs> regulatory compliance folks uh, and lawyers like myself. So they take great pains to comply with uh, all of the applicable government regulations. I think Bosch has about two page list of everything they comply with on an international basis because they sell internationally. Um, smaller manufacturers and particularly direct to consumer brands may or may not be in compliance. Um, and there's several ways that that can happen. You know, if you don't fit one or more of the definitional requirements, your product might not be uh, a lawful bike. So it, if it's designed and marketed for use on the road, um, you might see this in your social media feed if you've ever, if you've ever commented or, or spent too much time on an on a e-bike sponsored ad. Uh, if it can go faster than 20 miles per hour in motor power alone, you know, throttle bike that will just keep going above 20 miles per hour, uh, if that's actually a motor vehicle. Uh, that's the dividing line for uh, regulation by the CPSC. If it's lower than that, 20 miles per hour or lower, if it's over 20 miles per hour, it's regulated by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, just like cars, trucks, vans, motorcycles and, uh, and mopeds. Um, does the motor power exceed 750 watts? Um, you will see, of course, everyone wants to have the most powerful, the fastest, uh, you know, we blow the competition away, uh, those sorts of marketing claims. And you will see, you know, uh, 1500 watts, 2000 watts. I think I've seen a 6,000 watt uh, I'll call it a device um, promoted by the by the manufacturer. Um, that is not an e-bike. Um, does the does the machine have multiple modes? So uh, maybe I'm a clever manufacturer. I've I've got this uh, built-in program into that computer. I've got class one. I've got class two. Class three. And then I'm going to add an unlimited mode. So you know my rider, if they don't care to be limited to 28 miles per hour or 20 miles per hour, um, they can just click on unlimited and, and go as fast as they want. Um, the problem being that uh, NHTSA will look at what the maximum capability is when they're trying to decide if, if they are regulating this product. So they will use the ungoverned speed um, to test the capability uh, of, that, of that vehicle. If it can go faster than 20 miles per hour, it needs to meet their, their numerous requirements. Um, you know, the, basically the equipment you see on a, uh, on a moped, side mirrors, turn signals, uh, and it, the vehicle may require registration uh, under, under other state laws. Next slide. 
And if you, uh, the media is a little confused about what is an e-bike. Um, you know, our friend Simon Cowell here has, I think, broken some vertebrae, maybe his arm in two separate crashes on this device, which you can see from the battery. Um, it, it actually is an electric motorcycle that he decided to ride around the neighborhood and, and has injured himself twice. And the media says, Simon Cowell injured an e-bike accident. Well, it's not an e-bike, it's an electric motorcycle. Um, probably if he were not a celebrity, he'd, he'd get a ticket, you know, if he ran into law enforcement. Um, so uh, this, uh, I mean, it is an issue for the perception of e-bikes uh, in the public. And uh, it's something that consumers should be aware of um, because there are insurance implications, you know, you could ride this device off-road, but if you're riding it on the highway, public streets, um, you know, it's regulated by NHTSA, by the state of Minnesota, um, and it's not, not going to be a lawful vehicle if it's involved in a crash. It will not be covered by your, uh, vehicle, your homeowner's insurance or your motor vehicle insurance. You, you would be at fault for, for operating in your legal vehicles, as uh, Doreen alluded to earlier. Next slide. So where can you use your e-bike, assuming it's a, it's a legit e-bike? Uh, in, in Minnesota, um, under uh, the changes to the e-bike law, you can ride on any roadway, bicycle path, bicycle trail, uh, or shared use path, just like a regular uh, bicycle, um, unless it has been specifically prohibited. And there are additional statutes here that are cited in the slide, um, the DNR uh, and their state trails. Uh, uh, CAN has the authority to regulate what, what can be used on there. Um, uh, local grant and aid trails, uh, where the state has provided money to build a, a, a local, locally regulated trail. Uh, and of course, bikeways, roadways, shoulders, um, all of those are fine for e-bike use of all three classes, uh, unless uh, the state or a local governmental unit uh, has determined that operation of a, a one or more classes would be inconsistent with the safety or general welfare of trail users or the terms of any uh, property conveyance. Um, currently, the, this, of course, the e-bike law is relatively new. Um, I don't think we're aware of any real limitations on e-bike use at this time. Um, and the way that the model law was structured was to, de of course, define, as we said, to define what, an e what is an e-bike and the, in the, the range of, of vehicles out there, uh, and then authorize its use specifically, but give the this, this state and local uh, government authorities the, the ability, the power to restrict it um, as needed on a local basis. They would have to do, you know, what's called a rulemaking. Say we're announcing, hey, we're adopting an ordinance that says, you know, no e-bikes on, on the ABC trail and, and solicit public comment, but they would have the ability if they so choose to, uh, to regulate e-bikes, ban them entirely or restrict, restrict a particular facility to particular classes of e-bikes. Next slide. And this includes uh, right now class three e-bikes. They can operate on roadways, bicycle paths, trails, use shared use paths. Again, unless the local authority or state agency that has jurisdiction prohibits the operation. And with the same standard, there must make a determination. Uh, the uh, regulating authority must make a determination that there's a safety or property use uh, problem that justifies the restriction. Um, let, let me pause there. Is there any questions in the in the chat here that anyone would like address? Hey Matt, there was a question in the chat box here about homeowners insurance and the question um, around. Uh, well, I guess it was a comment, but the homeowners insurance. One of the webinar participants says that the homeowners insurance will not insure my e-bikes as bicycles. Would you like to speak to that? Um. Generally, a homeowner's insurance has an exclusion for motor vehicles. 
They don't want to cover anything related. Your motor vehicle's in the garage and the garage burns down. That's under your motor vehicle insurance, not your homeowner's insurance. Um, so it, and the, you know, insurance uh, underwriters are, are kind of playing catch up with e-bikes. Um, this question of, is it a motor vehicle or not? You know, it still varies. There's still some states where it might be considered a motor vehicle. Um, not for use purposes, but it's defined as a motor vehicle. And the uh, insurance company may argue if in a serious case, you know, we don't insure motor vehicles under this policy. Um, in, for purposes of an accident, if you were operating a lawful e-bike, you know, you would be covered under uh, and had a collision with a, a motor vehicle, you would be covered uh, under the no fault your own no fault policy, uh, the other person's no fault policy if they're at fault, um, and and maybe some underinsured, uninsured motorist coverage. So because it's now defined as a lawful vehicle, if it were not a, a lawful e bike, um, there would be a good argument from the motor vehicle insurer that they don't cover that. Um, so there are some nuances there and, and insurers are playing catch up. You know, what happens if a uh, e-bike is stolen? You know, is that, is that covered by my homeowner's insurance? Cause they're pretty expensive, but they can be. Um, and uh, a lot of, uh, there are, uh, there's growing coverage. Some insured homeowner's insurance carriers are saying, well, Hey, I, we want to, we're going to compete with our, with our other, those other insurance companies out there by offering this coverage and adding, saying, yes, we do cover e-bikes. Um, if, if that's not the case, then, um, you know, you can't purchase coverage specifically for uh, law, theft, damage, accident uh, related to an e-bike. So those would be some options. That's great information. And if, if people have a tip about, you know, uh, any ones that would be helpful to them, you know, feel free to share with the group here, you know. Um, there's a couple of other questions in the chat box here. And this is um, from one of our state agency partners. Can the local government restrict e-bike usage on state or federally funded trails? Um, yes. Yes, they can. I, I, the statute specifically authorizes a local government to restrict use on a state funded trail if they have jurisdiction over that trail. Uh, I don't believe that federal funding would impact the local states. Uh, there isn't a, a, a prohibition in, in the federal funding that I'm aware of that would mm -hmm. prohibit the state from regulating what can be used on that trail specifically for bikes. But specifically, a local government couldn't overrule the DNRs. Uh, so if you're talking about a state DNR trail, um, they could not uh, restrict use. But, but if it's a trail funded, it's a if it's a local trail that's funded with state or federal money, the local government can do what they uh, see fit. Hopefully that answers the question. If there's a follow up question, feel free to put that in the chat box so we can get clarification. I know there's a lot of nuances in this conversation around e bikes, and uh, you know the theme I'm hearing is figure out if your e bike is actually an e bike. You know that's pretty uh, key. So if you have an e-bike, and some people on this webinar today indicated that they do, uh, or at least think they do, you know, finding out if they do actually have one could help you in the conversation to follow uh, if you do run into any issues or questions. Uh, go, a, go ahead, Matt. And one way to kind of get a preliminary ruling uh, would be to talk to your insurance agent and say, "Hey, I've got an e-bike. Is it covered?" And uh, if it is, could you send me an email that says it's covered? And that would pre uh, likely preclude the insurance company from saying, no, we don't cover that thing. So. Great insights. And Dorian, you go ahead. Um... I was gonna, there's a question about, uh, are there any jurisdictions that prohibit the use of class three uh, e-bikes on trails? And I think as far as I know, it's only the DNR at Cuyuna, right, Matt? Is that correct? Next slide, please. Oh. 
Uh, yes, uh, as far as I am aware, and, and Dorian as well, only the only trail that currently prohibits e-bike use would be uh, and class three bikes at Cuyuna, which is uh, one, I think there is there are two DNR operated state uh, mountain bike trails currently. The rest are under local county, usually county or uh, three rivers locally. Um, is the land manager for, for mountain bike trails and they are they are not prohibited uh, on those trails uh, to our knowledge. So again, same uh, say kind of a, a, a more specific uh, grant of authority or recognition of the of the local authority or agency that that operates that natural surface trail mm -hmm. um, can regulate the operation of electric assisted bicycles just like they can sadly uh, prohibit all bicycles from, from some trails. Granted, that is very appropriate in some circumstances. Um, I have a question from Mr. Lynch. Has your hand raised? Yes, thank you. I wanted to ask, uh, hearing about the regulation that's happening on e-bikes, uh, to limit speeds and to be so concerned with uh, speeds of these vehicles on trails and roadways. I mean, we're not seeing that level of regulation for motor vehicles. And I sense that if, if bicyclists are pushed off of trails or other e-bicyclists are pushed off of trails or other public right of way, like they may not have anywhere other that's considered safe to go if the cars are still traveling at high rates of speed and being more destructive, massive objects. Like, how, how are we, how are we um, protecting this ability to use our e-bikes on, on trails? Like, I, the legislation that was passed is obviously doing that for us, but how are we able to preserve it? How are we making sure that you know, we can we can use our e-bike safely, and maybe maybe the cars could be more regulated. Well, you you are correct that cars are not regulated as to speed capability. You know, your speedometer uh, goes to you know one sixty. You know, in case if it's a European car, you know they don't really have speed limits on some of their autobahns. So I think they're putting them in place now for for climate change reasons. Um, I would I would love it if cars were had a governor that would you know, stop them at whatever the posted speed limit is. Cause my, my Volvos actually are not no longer capable of in most cases of <laughs> exceeding 65 miles per hour. Um, uh, Doran, do you want to speak to the work that you're doing um, to allow communities to lower uh, urban speed limits? There is a, there is a big push. Uh, and, and I think uh, most of you know that the legislature did allow lower urban speed limits uh, in in uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and a lot of communities are implementing those lower urban speed limits. You know, that's a that's a huge one. We certainly don't have the capacity, nor does the bike industry have the capacity to go to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, and Congress and say, you know, we want a law that, uh, and, and as many of you know, uh, new electric or new cars very often do have a, a, a little readout on the dashboard saying the speed limit here is 50 miles an hour. And, and but I think it's gonna be a long time before the car knowing that the speed limit is 50 miles an hour and your ability to exceed 50 miles an hour uh, is restricted. Um, I just don't see that happening. I don't see us taking on the it, Elon it would, Musk. It would be so easy. There's, the, there's so much electronics in that car. It actually, mm -hmm. uh, most people don't know, your car is actually tracking everything that you're doing when you're, if you're in a serious crash where there's multiple serious injuries, um, someone will be coming to retrieve the computer and all of the data in it that will tell them exactly how fast your car was going, the turns it took, all of that, uh, whether you used your brakes, all of that information was in your 
car computer, <laughs> not in my Volvos, <laughs> but uh, in your modern car uh, is actually tracking all that data uh, and it's available um, in an accident scenario. Um, that doesn't, of course, prevent any accidents, it just provides data for, for the lawyers and insurance companies. But um, I have, so uh, before we go back to uh, uh, Matt and, and Tony's question about 28 mile an hour bikes, uh, there was a question earlier about uh, the authority of a county or even MnDOT um, has put up signs on Highway 71 uh, uh, that say uh, right turn, you know, uh, right turn lane only uh, except bikes. And my thought is that neither MnDOT nor the local unit of government has the authority to do that. But Matt, what do you, what do you think? Can a local, can a local or MnDOT put up a sign that says it's legal to ride through this right turn lane? Um, I'm, I'm not sure on, on the status right now because of the, as far to the right um, law, um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's an exception there unless you know someone says it's okay you don't have to ride as far to the right um, but we've been working as you know to to uh make a change to that law to allow the rider to decide uh, where within the lane and specifically in in a right turn lane to ride to the left of the right turn lane to avoid the right turning traffic um i i think that's an open question right now and luke just a quick answer the the signs on US Highway 71 have been north of Sock Center, between Sock Center and Walker, I think, for or no, whatever. North of I-94 for decades. They've been there for decades. So um, but anyway, I it's a question we can't answer today. Uh Tony Desnick just made a comment about uh um uh is it a good idea, you know, to go 28 miles an hour just because you can? And uh, the answer is no. Uh, when anybody asks me at an e at the e-bike uh, challenge, the expo at the convention center a couple weekends ago, um, I said, "Are you, you know, are you going to use the bike that you buy for commuting um, on the road?" And uh, if they said no. Um, uh, I said, you don't need one that goes 28 miles an hour. So, but, uh, and Matt, Matt Lynch, did you still have a question? I see there's a Matt Lynch question in the chat box and I want to get back to him, but I do want to just recognize one point here. I have some chat box messages coming in and I see that there's some hands raised and things like that, that it, it sound, you know, we have the um, what's legal and what's not legal. And then we have some cultural types of questions that are coming through about what's actually happening, whether the law allows it or prevents it. And um, so there's some of those questions and comments coming through. So I just wanted to recognize both of those different pieces because I see a lot of people um, speaking up about what's actually happening that's not aligning with what these laws are saying. So I want to just recognize that uh, the folks that are commenting in those respects um, that, uh, you know, there is that disconnect oftentimes between what the law is and what's actually happening. So um, I'll direct it back to one more question here from Matthew, and then we have a couple of others. And um, we have the Matthew follow-up question is, um, imagine people on trails perceptions evolving to blaming e-bike capabilities for feeling unsafe on trails. If we become deemed unsafe to ride on trails, we get pushed. Through. Oh, this is the other question. Is that not a problem we may be proactively addressing? Um, there, uh, I mean, that is, uh, that was the issue. If you remember when, when mountain bikes first uh, came on the scene, um, they were started to be used on hiking trails and, and horse trails and multi-use trails and walking trails. And um, there was a perception of uh, them being unsafe. Uh, so a lot of work had to be done uh, uh, for rider education, um, really uh, a big movement to create um, separate trails that are, are mount designed for mountain and used for mountain bike only. 
um, to address those user concerns and, and, and kind of move that traffic off. Um, I would say e-bikes having been passed by myself, myself on off-road and road trails by, by EMTBs that are extremely quiet and, and come up rather quickly, uh, it can be disconcerting. Um, so people for bikes is is recognizing that and 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 putting some uh, time and attention into rider education, not just where can I ride my e-bike and how fast can it go, it's how should I ride that. So currently the reader the real kind of epicenter of of rider uh, walker um, conflicts is Southern California. If you've if you've been on any of those wonderful uh, paved facilities right on the beach um, in Los Angeles and in and, and that whole area. Um, there are lots of people walking, lots of people, lots of them are tourists and they're, you know, they might not have been on a paved trail for a while, but there's a, there are, there are shared use trails. And, uh, you know, originally it was cruiser bikes, you know, with a coaster brake and very hard to get up to any kind of speed. And, and some of the sections have like a a five mile an hour speed limit. Um, so uh, there have been user conflicts. Uh, some of the, the tourists will rent an e-bike and suddenly find out they can go 28 miles per hour. And again, a lot of the, what I would call out of category vehicles that actually can go a lot faster. A lot of those companies are based in Southern California because they have that you know great 70 degree weather year round. It's a, it's a legitimately, legitimate vehicle you can use every day it just doesn't doesn't fit the definition of what what it should be um so there have been user conflicts actual accidents i think a feeling of being unsafe wouldn't be enough to support a determination um you know by a, a local government unit uh to to ban them but actual accidents um with users involving involving e-bikes or other uh other motorized um uh, we vehicles with two wheels, um, they could lead a, uh, a a government to ban them. Um, and just the a best, quick, the best yeah. approach is user education. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and and I think with the support that we have with the legislature and local governments, uh, I think they too recognize that education is the problem pro, uh, uh, solution, not regulation. Um, I don't think the legislature would vote to ban them on state trails or anything like that. So. Um, and the other, I mean, the other kind of, I will say a looming issue um, is the fact that there are these uh, uh, electric uh, devices that exceed the capability of an e-bike. And currently, uh, not much is being done, if, if anything, by federal agencies to regulate those. Um, what you are seeing, I think, uh, of course, the government kind of had a has to have had a reset here. They couldn't hold public hearings, but the, the CPSC did have a meeting, I think, in 2020, uh, late 2020, to talk about mobility, including e-bikes, e-scooters, um, all the you know, various uh, hoverboards were, I think, on the table there. So they were, you know, concerned about um, growing number of consumer injuries, especially with rental electric scooters. Um, so they had a meeting with advocates and industry folks to talk about that. They haven't launched any regulatory process. Um, the one change that has happened is that emergency room physicians are now going to be tracking um, e-bike accidents separately from bicycle accidents um, so that we can actually have some statistics on, on how dangerous they, they may be um, as a consumer product. Um, and I think that would drive any, uh, any regulatory efforts. Uh, and NHTSA, um, to my knowledge, has not had any enforcement proceeding against uh, one of these out of category uh, uh, e-bikes to date. Thanks, I would say as my, my general opinion is the government will do something if there's a problem or the plaintiff lawyers will do something uh, if there's a problem 
Uh, if people are injured, of course, as you know, from TV injured in an accident, what do you do? Um, so we are starting to see uh, kind of the tip of the iceberg on litigation where someone's injured using an e-bike. They actually tend to be new, new people coming to the sport. You know, they buy an e-bike, maybe online, not through a bike shop. Um, and on their first ride, um, they have a problem with the brake or something's wrong with the assembly. Um, and, and there's an accident injury. Um, so uh, that's, a, of course, is a trend the industry is, is keeping an eye on because the perception of the product is being unsafe. Uh, you know, we don't want that. We want people to enjoy bikes and, and e-bikes and, and do so safely. So, Absolutely. It's getting people rolling and that's what we want to encourage. So I do have a couple of slides that are closing slides here and one closing question. We are at time, but if folks are What's able so to fast. think... I uh, know it always does. It always does. <laughs> uh, if if uh, you know if Matt and Dorian are able to stay for a few minutes here, we'll uh, field uh, at least one more question, and everyone else is welcome to stay too. I do want to get through the last couple of slides here because I know Matt, you had a slide here that had some resources you wanted to share with folks, which we can put up in the chat box for you, and then we have one other slide we'd like to to share. Um, Matt, did you want to speak to this slide just uh, as a close for a presentation, and then we can uh, pivot into a couple of more closing questions? Certainly, um, and People for Bikes is really taking the the, the lead on e-bike education, regulation on a national level, funding for um, the e-bike purchases. Um, you know, there was a real effort this year and we came very, very close on getting a tax credit for to support e-bike purchases, uh, which would have been amazing because um, they are more expensive and, and really would help uh, people with lower incomes and fixed incomes um, to, to access them. Um, we haven't given up on that. Um, but People for Bikes has great resources. Um, you, you can learn a lot. Uh, uh, there's a statement on out of category uh, e-bikes, their stance on that. I might have had something to do with their drafting of that. Um, so, uh, it, and uh, we'll have uh, some contact information for me. I'll, I don't know if you have my email, but I'm happy to answer email questions as well. Or, or oh yeah, there it is. Um, so, uh, people for bikes also will works closely with state advocates, but we have an e-bike committee that involves all of the major manufacturers and they meet regularly to, to craft strategy and, and, uh, try and help, uh, the cycling community, um, as this, as this change really change happens with the kind of electrification of, of the cycling industry. Thank you, Matt, and thanks for both for your presentations, Matt and Dorian. Uh, as you see on the screen, I have a slide up here with contact information with email addresses and uh, with Dorian, he's uh, provided his telephone number as well. Um, before I take the last couple of closing questions here for the speakers, we wanna make sure that we invite people to uh, get rolling. I know it's it's rainy and snowy and in a lot of the states is a little bit of a mess right now weather-wise, but we have a lot of events coming up here in the Metro. There's a list of different events here, Fulton Grand Fonto, Fondo, uh, Udipoles as we featured in February, some bike swaps, Alley Cat. And then in Greater Minnesota, the Lake Alice 100, we featured uh, them before as a speaker. And uh, as I mentioned in the slide previously, Bike to School Day on May 4th, uh, Lake Pepin, 30 Days of Biking, Keep Rolling. And, uh, and we uh, look forward to hearing more stories and seeing pictures as well. And also invite everyone to join us in May on the 18th to talk open streets. So um, there was a question uh, in a couple of questions in the chat box. And I want to turn it over to Tony Desnick. He had a follow-up question that he'd like to ask uh, to the speakers. So uh, Tony, if you'd like to join, you can uh, ask your question now. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I just wanted to give a little context to my earlier um, question slash comment about the wisdom of 28 mile an hour. I, th I think that that question happens in the context of two groups who are coming to e-bikes. Um, the group I think is elderly people who haven't ridden for decades. And the other is also elderly people who have never ridden and coming to a bike that goes that fast. And, and I'm no longer middle-aged, I'm 68, so I get to call myself an elderly person in the context of this question. Um, but I think that it's really important that um, we, we, we keep that in mind, I think, in terms of how fast 
we should begin to legislate these bikes can go. And I'm curious, both Matt and Doreen, what your thought is about that. Um, I, I will say again, a, a, a 28 mile per hour is bike is only going to go that fast. If you're, if you're providing pedaling input, um, there, I think more of the higher performance, um, e-bikes that, um, uh, uh, are, are now really mostly seeing a lot of growth in off-road, uh, class three e-bikes. That's kind of where the action is in the industry. Um, a lot of the bikes that would be, you know, chosen by a first time rider at the lower end would be uh, class one or class two um, bikes. Uh, thr the throttle bikes are very popular because the rider doesn't have to pedal at all if they don't want to. Um, so uh, it, generally to get those, uh, a class three capable bike, you are, you're gonna be spending uh, some more money. Um, so, I think it really comes down to the the retailer or the online seller to educate that user about the capabilities of their bike. Um, you know, that's that's why QBP supports, you know, people buying from a bike retailer so they can get both advice on what bike is right for them and they can get the follow-up maintenance that is going to be uh, problematic for a for an online seller with uh, with maybe one location and not a doesn't have a service network. And it is a it is a concern. Um, I will say there's a lot of uh, people who have accidents with regular bikes too. We're unfortunately number two after automobile accidents in those emergency room visits, um, and they can happen for uh, any number of very crazy reasons. So um, it, you can you can crash your bike, and you can you can crash your e-bike too. I think the speed. Um, I think actually. What I've seen in the in the litigation is more uh, issues around braking, either braking's braking working too quickly or unexpectedly, or or brakes not working as well as the rider thought they would work. That sounds good. And thanks, Ted, for putting in the chat box a link to REI on introduction to e-bikes. We do have someone with a raised hand. So, uh, Karen, would you like to ask your question? I don't really have a question. I have a comment. I've heard so much about the top speed. Okay, I'm in my 70s. I don't go 20 miles an hour. I bike at what I usually have biked at, which is 10, 12 miles an hour max. However, nobody's talked about the fact that I've been a bike commuter for years, but I can't ride my bike uphill into the wind to work. And when we have 50 mile an hour wind gusts, I could never ride my regular bike. So I got an e-bike last fall. I have ridden every single day. And so it's really empowered me. I don't use the motor when I'm just going on a flat surface. I treat it like a regular bike. When I'm going uphill or especially uphill into the wind, I use my e-bike. And for that reason, I've been able to ride every single day. So I think you have to look at it from the perspective of not all elderly want to go that fast. We just don't. But the e-bike has enabled me to continue commuting easily. Thanks. Karen, thanks for sharing that. I mean, there's a lot of stories out there like that. My, my, my riding buddy, uh, my college buddy who introduced me to mountain bikes back in the eighties, which kind of led to my career in the bike industry in a, in a roundabout way. Uh, he's suffered some back injuries in a, in an automobile accident and was no longer able to ride off road. Uh, couldn't keep up with me. It was very frustrating. And then, uh, then he got an e-bike and, uh, we've been able to, to go on rides together. And then I'm the one that's kind of struggling at the end of the ride. I'm hoping his battery is running down, but he got a new one now. The battery life is way too long, so I don't know what we're going to do, but uh, it's really enabled, uh, you know, a, a second a second go around for biking uh, for him and uh, us able to, to share the sport that we love. So there's a lot of stories out there about how e-bikes can, can make it possible um, for folks that otherwise couldn't do it or can't do it anymore. Uh, I'm not in that camp yet, but, you know, the you know, the clock is running, so. And I think the statistics that People for Bikes likes to share 
um, back up what Karen's saying. Uh, people do not ride e-bikes at their maximum speed. Uh, they ride them, uh, you know, maybe just a couple miles an hour faster than they did before. But I'll turn it back to you, Natalie. Thanks, Dorian. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your story, Karen, and for Matt sharing your story as well. I'd like to close the webinar with a couple of the supportive comments people shared in the chat box. You know, it's great to hear the story and to hear how people are using the e-bikes as our topic today. And uh, Karen, uh, you received a couple of comments in here. Yahoo, you go, Karen. I've seen you out there on the blistery days, another fellow Rochester person. Uh, way to go, Karen. That's fantastic. And that e-bikes allow you to dress professionally and bike commute without needing to take a shower at work. So uh, great to hear. Thank you for your stories. Keep rolling and join us for our webinar in May on open streets. Thank you everyone. And thanks especially to our guest speakers today, um, Jake for sharing the information on the funding opportunity and Dorian and Matt for presenting on e-bikes. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks everybody.